We are in the series called Fearless Beginnings. We believe that God has something in store for us that's going to require a new level of boldness and courage and confidence. Matter of fact, go ahead and tell the person next to you, you got what it takes. Come on, go ahead, let them know. Come on, you got what it takes. Fearless Beginnings. Fearless Beginnings. If we don't see God move on our behalf, it's not going to be because of fear. Fearless Beginnings. How many of you uh, enjoy the cold weather that we've been having the last few uh, days? Yeah, 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 like two of y'all. And uh, I love you. We'll share heaven together, but I don't understand you. I don't get it. We're going to share the same heaven together, but you're going to be on the other side. As for me and my house, we're going to be on the Miami side of heaven. You know what I'm talking about? How many people feel your boy right here? I just don't like it. I just don't. I don't, I don't enjoy the cold weather at all. Earlier this week, I was in downtown Martinsburg having a conversation with a guy about the weather, and he made the statement, and it caught me a little off guard. He said, brother, I'm telling you what, it's so cold cold right now, I'm looking forward to hell. I said, brother, wear a jacket. Wear a jacket. Give me Jesus and a jacket. If it's that cold outside, don't look for hell. Go inside, have a coffee. I'll buy it. Come on. Isn't that crazy how our mind works sometimes? There is a psychological phenomenon. It's called survival instinct. It's where our body and our mind will take us to extreme places for self-preservation anything to stay alive, stay alive, stay alive. Get me out of this discomfort. Get me out of this pain. Get me out of this drama. Get me out of this hurt. Get me out of this, uh, whatever this is for you. Our mind will go to extreme measures for self-preservation. The problem with that is that self-preservation can sometimes lead us to self, self, self-destruction. We're actually damaging ourselves, trying to preserve ourselves from pain. Woo! And what is true of the physical is true of the emotional and the mental. And can I just say it? The relational. Some of us, we have been through some stuff. We've been through some challenges. We've been through some storm. And it hurt. And there's no placating that. It hurt. There's no candy coating that. It hurt. Everybody say, it hurt. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're anything like me, what we tend to do then is build up walls and a facade and we'll throw out our elbow and we'll keep people at arm's length because we never want to be hurt like that again. What's that all about? Survival instinct, self-preservation, going to extreme measures so that that we won't feel that pain again, not realizing that in the self-preservation, there's self-destruction. In order for this to be a new year, we're going to have to allow God to do a new thing. And it's going to require us to do something that we've never done before or do something that we used to do, but we put it down. But now we're going to have to pick it back up. We say it all the time. Happy New Year in January. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. For some of us, it's happy last year repeated. Happy a very familiar year yet again. No, no, no. We're going to break some things off of our life this year because we're going to do the hard work in developing a new mindset so that we can be a new person. Come on, somebody say happy new year. Let me put this in your spirit. A couple verses for you. Second Corinthians chapter 10, the apostle Paul wrote the church in Corinth. We take captive. This is not a passive statement, is it? No, this is an aggressive statement. We take captive. We got some work to do. We take captive what? That person, that problem, no, because sometimes we can't do anything about them. We take captive our thoughts. Everybody say, think about it, (laughs) right? We have to think about the thoughts we've been thinking about, and we take them captive, and we make it, we force it, we hammer it to become more like Christ. How can we take our thoughts captive if we're not willing to confront toxic thoughts? The Bible saying, let's do it differently. First Peter says, cast all your anxiety on God because he cares for you. So not only is God a mighty God and he can do something about what we're stressed out about, he wants to do something what we're stressed out about. Why? Because he cares for us. But how can we cast all of our stress and anxiety and worry and fear and dilemmas and traumas and drama on God if we're too busy protecting our own emotions? Cast your cares on him. How if we're spending all of our time building walls of self-preservation? Imagine somebody gave you tickets to an all-inclusive resort in the Bahamas. 
Come on, that's what I'm talking about. Yes, Lord, I just want to be used by you. I just want to be used by you. This is an all-inclusive five-star resort right about now. It sounds pretty good, right? I'm talking about jet skiing. I'm talking about golfing. I'm talking about spas. I'm talking about the infinity pool. Day eight of 21 days of prayer and fasting. I'm thinking about all-you-can-eat buffets. Come on, somebody. I feel the Holy Ghost on that. Oh, I feel it. Imagine you're on day eight of this, of this, of this extended stay vacation. And it dawns on you, I've not changed my clothes since I've been here. I'm still wearing the nasty, dirty, stanky sweatpants and hoodie that I wore for comfort on the airplane. I've been scuba diving in it. I've been going to the restaurants in it. I went to the spa in it. I went jet skiing in it. I went and played golf in it. I stank. And the reason why you stank is because you haven't changed your clothes. And the reason why you haven't changed your clothes isn't because the luggage didn't arrive. It's just because you decided to put the luggage in the corner of the hotel because you didn't want to take the time to unpack your bags. When it comes to life, how many times we walk through a new spacious season? The Bible says that God came to give us life and life to the fullest. And sometimes I'm just wondering if new seasons feel like the last season and a prolonged uh, traumatic season because we don't want to deal with the luggage in the corner because it's going to take a little bit of time. But tell the person next to you, you stink. <laughs> just let them know. <laughs> Today we're going to deal with it. Today we're going to deal with it. Last week we were in Joshua chapter 1, and the title of that message was Finding Stability in seasons of uncertainty. How do we find a a grounding to our faith and our mind and our hope and our trust when all of life appears to be stormy and chaotic? That was last week. This week, the word of God is gonna take us to Joshua chapter two. We're just continuing the narrative. The people of God were under Egyptian rule and captivity for 400 years. And you know the story. God sent Moses, and Moses said, Pharaoh, let God's people go. Through a series of miracles, Pharaoh set God's people free and they found themselves wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses has now died and Joshua is now the one in charge and he has led the people of God on the outskirts of Canaan near Jericho. That is to say, they are on the brink of entering the promised by God land and season. Knock, knock, who's there is their destiny. Woo, they are so close. This is, this is last year's New Year's resolution, but now it looks like it's going to come to pass. When we fast forward, the narrative that I'm about to read is Joshua chapter 5, and it gives us this idea that Joshua, their fearless leader, he woke up early in the morning, and he walks away from the rest of the camp, and he's on this solitary, isolated path, and he's walking around just a few hundred yards away from Jericho. Jericho is being occupied by giants. It's a fierce, it's a, it, it's a fierce people. Um, in our context, like maybe we would refer to them as the Taliban. Like they were, they, they were extremely aggressive. They were anti God's people. They were strong in number. They would behead the people of God. Like it was crazy. They had reasons to be afraid. Joshua is walking around the walls of Jericho and he's prayerfully, strategically thinking about his day and what comes next. Now, this is not in the Bible, but I just want to point out what could have been in the mind of Joshua. Sometimes we do ourselves a disservice from understanding the tension of the text when we just refer to these people as Bible characters, like a Harry Potter novel. No, no, no. These are real individuals who just happen to be in the Bible. God is using their story to confront our story. Joshua was a real person. He would have battled the same thoughts that we would have uh, been battling if we were in his sandals, Right? And I'm just wondering if he just looked up and he saw the walls of Jericho and if his mind didn't go back several years earlier when Moses has brought them to this place. See, this wasn't the first time Joshua and the people had been here. Joshua has been here before. It was under Moses. Maybe you remember years earlier, Moses had sent in the 12 spies to go spy out the land and then to bring back a positive report of the promises of God. And the first half of their report was filled with good news. 
you can just see the chairman of the spies coming up to Moses. Mo, you ain't going to believe it. It's incredible. God was right when he said the land is spacious. It's flowing with milk and honey. That is to say the harvest is plentiful. The soil is rich. It's just like God said it would be. However, we have some bad news that we need to tell you about. And this was their report. Numbers 13. But the men, talking about the other spies who had gone up with Joshua and Caleb, they said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among their coworkers, their classmates, their teammates, their church, their city. They spread amongst their kids and their spouse. They spread a bad report about the land that they had explored. They, they found everything negative in what God was trying to do. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. See what fear does? See how fear will go extreme measures for self-preservation? Even what they're saying is not even true. How can the land devour those living in it and there's people living in it? But that's what fear does. All the people we saw there are of great size. Matter of fact, they were descendants of Anak, the Nephilim. These were giants. There's giants living in the land. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Notice how they saw themselves framed, how they believed they were being seen. Because of their fearful report, the Bible says in the very next chapter, the entire camp of Israel became afraid. And their fear drove them away from their destiny, away from the promised land, back into obscurity and the wilderness. I just want to point out, the nation wasn't afraid until they observed people who were. I wonder what you're passing around. However... Before we shame them for their fear, let's be honest, we can't blame them for their fear. After all, they have spent their entire life in captivity. This is all they know. The bigger oppress the weaker. The stronger rule the weak. The prideful and the arrogant and the influencers are always, are always lording over the humble. This is all they know. So when they see bigger, stronger, faster, capable, it triggers their trauma. It triggers their pain. It triggers their thoughts that I am inferior to their capabilities. It triggers their trauma. And that's why we're talking about it today because how can it be a new year if it's not a new you? How can it be a new season if we don't deal with the luggage in the corner? For 40 years, this group of people wandered in the wilderness simply because they didn't deal with last year's hurt. If it's going to be a new year, we're going to have to address some old mindsets. But we're doing it for our future. Come on, we're doing it for our kids. Let's go. We're doing it for our spouse and our marriage. We're doing it for our coworkers and class. Come on, we're doing it for us. Somebody say we're doing it. Traumatic relational experiences, write this down, will leave you suspicious of others. Once you've been through some interpersonal trauma, disappointment, betrayal, a drop of trust, a traumatic relational experience will always leave you suspicious of others if you don't deal with it. Can I go on? Suspicion will lead you to self-preservation. The problem with that is self-preservation leads to self-destruction. The very thing we're searching to protect us ends up hurting us because that facade gives us a false sense of hope and security. I'll keep everybody else out of my life. I'll be kind, I'll be professional, I'll be respectful, but I'm not gonna let them in to the core of my heart because I don't wanna be hurt again. Not realizing that your healing is on the other side of community. Watch this now. Traumatic relational experiences will have you becoming both investigator and prosecutor all at the same time. It's where you're walking around searching for evidence. I spy with my little eye. You're up to no good. And I'll prove it to you. Why did you look at me that way? They didn't look at you no way. They had so 
something else on their mind. But see how pain in our past projects on the other people, our internal pain and struggle? Yeah. Pastor, you're preaching good. I know, because I've lived this junk out. Why did they give me a half smile? Who cares how they smiled? Hey. Why was that conversation so short? What was up with their body language? Why did their eyes go to the left when they answered the question? Maybe because something caught their eye. <laughs> but see how paranoia paralyzes our peace and it imprisons our perspective? So now we're just walking around eye spying with my little eye, investigator mode, trying to pick up evidence that validates their problem. Why did they use that word? Why wasn't I invited? And then what happens is, are you ready for this? Like we just getting up in the weeds this morning. <laughs> what happens is we start fighting battles that aren't even real. <laughs> we start reading between the lines when nothing was said. We start assuming the worst about other people. Oh, I know they up to no good. No, the devil's up to no good. That's why he's up in your business. You start overcomplicating simple questions. They just ask a question. Why are you writing a novel investigate? Well, you start turning their bad day into your bad day. You start reading tone into their text messages and emotions into their email. I'll never forget. Uh, this guy sent me a long text message about something that uh, he didn't really care for. And it was a long, it was like a Harry Potter novel. It was, it was crazy in length. And so, and so I said, hey, I'm having trouble understand. Could you help clarify a couple points for me? Da, 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 da. He, he sent me back another grand article and uh and uh and then it clicked on, oh i know what he's trying to say and so i wanted him to know oh i get it now so i simply responded okay i get it exclamation point oh okay i get it i get it that's how my spirit wrote the text but somewhere between okay i get it exclamation point to him reading the text it became okay i got it exclamation point Oh, pastor, who do you think you are sending me exclamation point? And I was excited I got it. You were very crafty in your language. I wanted you to know, well done, you good and faithful linguistic that you are. But isn't that crazy what paranoia does? Paranoia will always project onto other people your internal pain unless you deal with it. Trauma will always trap our thinking. Write this down. Trauma is destabilizing. It's an internal tornado that will wreak havoc against the organization of your peace and joy. Watch this now. All negative emotions are rooted in fear. Isn't that crazy you think about it? All of them. All of them. We can tether all of our emotions into one, into one controlling thought, fear. Anxiety is rooted in fear. Insignificance, rooted in fear. Insecurities, rooted in fear. Jealousy, contentment, anger, malice, gossip. All these, all, these, all these negative emotions are rooted into fear. Well, if all negative emotions are rooted in fear, what is at the root of fear? Control. Control. Watch this. You have never felt in control and fearful at the same time. Fear comes from feeling out of control. Therefore, we have to address the control issue and the fear issue to, 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 in, uh, to address the behavioral issues that stem from these. Watch this. James chapter 4. Where does stuff like this come from? James 4. This is the brother of Jesus. He says, what causes fights among you? Don't they come from your desires to battle within you? You desire, you want something, you want to control something, the outcome, that person, the situation, the result. You want, but you do not have it. You can't control it. So you kill. And maybe you're not walking around murdering people, but maybe you are with your words and negativity. Maybe you're murdering your own peace and joy and faith in Christ because you want and don't. And you don't have, so you covet, you want control, but you cannot get it. So you fight again. You do not have because you're not giving God control. So watch it. This verse is telling us that fear can be spiritual. Because at the core of our emotions, we haven't given control to God. So fear can be spiritual. 
But now let's just break it down to where we really live. Are you ready? Fear can also be natural. As in, if you're taking notes, learned helplessness. Where we become afraid because we taught ourselves how to be a student of fear. Whew. You, you teach yourself what to do with your emotions. And you teach others how to treat you with your emotions. Learned helplessness. Let's look at this. Academic failure. I tried really, really hard and I studied a, a lot to make a decent grade. I got the grade back and it wasn't what I desired. I must be stupid. I studied and made a bad grade. They didn't study and they made a great grade. I must not be as smart as they are. And if I'm not going to be as smart as they are, and if I'm going to study and it doesn't really make a difference, then what does it matter? And you allow a report card to infect the Imago Dei who you really are. Because of a letter? A letter? But see how the devil does? Learned helplessness. Therefore, I just don't pick up on things easily. Therefore, I'm just uneducated. Therefore, I don't try new things. And I, no, 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 learn helplessness. Workplace burnout. This is where the people you work with are so toxic and you've been so committed to taking the high road and trying to shine the light of Jesus and hope in a dark environment, but they're not catching it. They're not getting it. And so you just want to snuff out your own light. The answer to darkness is not you extinguishing your light. It's to keep shining like a star in the universe for which you have been both anointed and appointed in a, in, in a particular location to make a difference. They may not say thank you for your peace and your joy, but they watching. Workplace burnout. Relational dynamics, no matter how hard I try to pray and to show respect and service and honor to my spouse, they're never going to treat me any different. So you know what? I give up and I quit. Learned helplessness. No matter how hard I make uh, a conscious decision to be better at self-affirmation and listening to worship and listening to positive things or eating right. I'm never going to get out of this, of this funk that I'm in, the sickness that I've got. And so why even bother? So fear can be spiritual. It can also be learned helplessness. That's why some of you, you are still filled with so much anxiety even after you pray because you're trying to pray away what your behavior keeps picking up. And how can fresh water and salt water live in the same aquarium? It can't. And so you're trying to rebuke a spirit that your self-deprecation keeps picking up. God, would you remind me that I'm the apple of your eye, that I'm a city on a hill, I'm the salt of the world, I'm the light of the world. Lord, would you remind me that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made? Dang, I'm so stupid. It's not going to work. Unpack your bags. This is a new year for you. This is a new year for you. Fear can be spiritual. It's also learned. Check out, the, check out, check out their statement back in verse uh, 33. 33. The spies said, we saw the giants there. And we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. The projection of how they saw themselves was projected onto the, the size of their problems. We look like grasshoppers to them. How do they know what they look like to grasshoppers? They're supposed to be spies. They don't know what they look like to the giants. You're telling me that these spies went into the promised land and they took a survey with their little clipboard and the little Sharpie pen? Excuse me, Mr. Giant, sir. Can I have a few moments of your time? When you perceive me, what member of the animal kingdom comes to mind? Is it A, the mighty Mufasa? Is it B, the snuggly, lovely dog, Bluey? Or is it, see, a grasshopper? Grasshopper, you say? I'll be sure to take this account to Moses. That never happened. But how they saw themselves was projected onto the people they perceived to be, have a problem. And that's what fear does. It paralyzes our perspective and trauma traps our thinking to only see self-preservation at our own self-destruction. Can I talk about it for a minute? 
Don't you wish you could go back in time and undo some things that have been done? Don't you wish you could go back in time and help a, a child out? Don't you wish you could go there right now and help a child out? What if, what if, what if, what if we could get into a biblical rocket ship and travel back in time and just, hey, spies, come here a second, huddle up, huddle up, drop the clipboard, honey. Come here, come here a second. Hey, fellas, sirs, what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? You're saying that God can't give us what he promised us. And you're saying that we should go no further because, the, because there's giants living in the land and they're hiding behind big, fierce, mighty, strong walls. You have associated the strength of the people because of the size of their walls. Let's inverse that thinking. What if the reason why they built such walls is because they're afraid inside? Why would you need mighty walls if you weren't mighty afraid? Hey, spies, don't forget, you've been a people for the last 40 years without any walls. And yet God has been your defender. God has been your protector. God has been your provider. God has been your sustainer. God has been your manna in the morning. God has been your healer up on the pole. God has been fighting for you. What if the size of their wall is not an indicator of the size of their strength, but a size of their fear? And by the way, when you keep reading the narrative of Joshua, we find out that's exactly what it was. Because in Joshua chapter 2, Rahab, who was a citizen of the land of the giants, told two of the spies, when we heard of you and how your God fights for you, we were afraid of you. No wonder their walls are so big. They're afraid. The people of God won't advance because they're afraid of something that's actually been afraid of them. But traumatic thinking paralyzes our perspective. And when our per perspective and our peace in God has been paralyzed by paranoia, how can we ever reverse the curse and say what you meant for evil, God will turn it around and use it for his glory and my good. And so if we want this to be a new year of fearless beginnings, we're going to have to learn a new way of thinking. Are you ready? I love how all truth is God's truth, right? And it's easy as the ABCs. Watch this, ABCs. When you're stuck in fear, when you're battling anxiety, when you sense the presence of paranoia or self-preservation, how are you going to get out of that rut and that funk? Well, the Word of God is going to help us. Watch this. Think about the ABCs. There's an activator. This is an event that took place. This was the moment of letdown, disappointment, or betrayal. This was the loss. This was the hardship. This is what comes to your mind when you're triggered by trauma. There's an activator. The activator is going to inform your belief system, which will then give you the consequences of what you feel next. You will never have this because of this without first this going through this. You follow me on this? We, we have a belief system about the things that have transpired in our life. Back to Joshua. They have big walls, and the people there are giants. We don't stand a chance. The land and the people will devour us. Better we drift back into chaotic wondering, for at least we felt powerful and in control in the wilderness. We better run and hide. Versus what Joshua says. Watch this. Joshua says in Joshua 3, 5, now people of God. He says, consecrate yourself for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. It looks like this. Back to the ABCs. Yep, they have big walls. Yeah, the people are stronger than I am. But my God is bigger than my problem. He shall supply all my needs according to his riches and his glory. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I'm not who I used to be. I'm far from where I've been, but I'm in transition and transformation and God will go with me. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's the great I am. He's a rose of Sharon. He's peace in the morning. He's joy on tomorrow's horizon. Oh, he is with me. And if my God is for me, then I can do and become and be everything he's called me to be. There Therefore, I shall trust him and therefore live in peace. If you can't sleep at night, check your belief in regards to the activating event. 
Something happened. This doesn't change. You change this, this will come with it. New year, new you, new mindset. We take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ as we cast our cares upon him. I love the Jewish rabbi, Jonathan Sachs. He said this, we are not a people who simply endure trials and hardships. Rather, we define them. He's talking about the belief system. We define them. Laughter is our protest against the difficult. We get to choose how we live in the hard. You get to choose. You get to choose. Unpack your bags. Stand up with me across this place. If you would say, you know what? Uh, this hit a little too close from home. I think I have some residue of some past pain in my life and I need God's help to help me unpack these mental bags. I need a new belief system so I can experience a new source and season of freedom in my life. As an outward sign of an inner shift in our thinking to break some chains and some ropes that have held us back. Would you stretch your hand towards heaven? Lord, you see the hands that are raised as an indicator of a heart that has been through some stuff. And Lord, we're not trying to just medicate some things away and ignore some things away and excuse some things and sweep some things. No, we're surrendering some things over to you. Would you replace the trauma now with thinkings of our testimony, the pain with praise, the discomfort with a clear direction that as for me and my mind and my household, we are going to serve God. Whereas there's been pain and agony and disappointment and trauma, would you replace the pain with the newfound resolve, what was meant for evil, God will turn it around and he will use it for my ultimate good and ultimately for his glory. We give it over to you the best way we know how. We cast our cares upon you, believing that you care for us. Let us walk in that stream of confidence and consciousness. In Jesus' mighty name, somebody said amen.